Okay, so today, today we're going to talk about section 4.2. Now, we're going to leave 4.1 to uh, Math 14, um, uh, so that'll be the next semester for, for many of you. What that has to do with is related rates, and that's a class of problems that um, uh, tend to be kind of difficult to do, and, and so we're going to skip over that and get a little bit more familiar with um, uh, some applications of derivatives before you get to that. So we're going to look at minimum and maximum values. And, and like I said earlier, we've, we've talked about this before. And I, I just want to put it in, in more or less a, a calculus perspective um, uh, today. OK, so a, a lot of this has to do with uh, just definitions of terms. And so let's, um, let's look at this. If we have uh, a number c in the domain of a function, then we would call um, f at c the absolute maximum value if it's equal to or greater than any other value in that function over the domain. And it's the absolute minimum value um, if it's less than or equal to any other um, value in the domain. So the, the, the um, absolute minimums and absolute maximums can occur in more than one place. Um, oftentimes they only occur in one place, but you can easily envision, you know, functions that, that have more than one absolute minimums and absolute maximums. Not every function has an absolute minimum or maximum. Obviously, if you have a line, that line is defined over the whole domain of all, uh, the, the, the um, excuse me, the, uh, the domain of a function that's a line is all real numbers, and so there is no minimum and maximum because it can increase uh, without bound and also decrease without bound. So these things are, are things that, that may or may not exist with a function. Uh, the important um, uh, aspect of this is that we would call it the absolute uh, minimum and maximum. Sometimes you'll see other um, uh, authors call it the global minimum or maximum, and um, uh, that's a, a term that you'll probably see more in, in things like computer programming where they talk about global variables and things of that sort. Uh, global in this sense mean over the whole domain, that, that it, it, it's kind of um, uh, uh, just a usage of a word that, that perhaps isn't the most natural usage, but it, it, you do still see it. And then we also call it um, the extreme value for the, um, for the function. So we do have a theorem that's going to come up called the extreme value theorem, and that's exactly what it's talking about, uh, are the minimums and maximums of a function over a certain interval rather than over the whole domain. So um, I, I guess the terms here are absolute maximum, absolute minimum, the global um, uh, mins and maxes, and then the uh, extreme values. OK, so. Um, we talked about local mins and maxes as well, and so a, a local maximum is um, it's kind of like the local peaks. If you look over a mountain range, like if you stand up on top of a, a, a mountain and you look around to the other mountains, you could have peaks that are lower or higher, but you have kind of this local peak. And so there's no precise definition on how close you need to be to... Uh, uh, to have a, a, a local maximum, and in fact, if you define your I I intervals of interest wider, you know, you'll end up eliminating some global uh, or, or some local uh, maximums. Same thing with the local minimums. We're just looking for the points that, um, that are the, um, the, the minimums <laughs> or the maximum values in a, in a very narrow range. And so if I um, just draw a little diagram here, you can see in this um, function that the absolute maximum occurs to the, um, uh, to the left of the y-axis and the lo uh, local maximum occurs to the, to the right. Then we have an absolute minimum. And when you're talking about things that are around this absolute uh, uh, minimum here, you, you could be talking about a local minimum if you're just talking about a very short range of... of um, uh, uh, of x values that you're going to use to, to figure what this uh, minimum is. So it, it's not so important that you make the, over an interval, that you say, well, is this the uh, uh, local min or is it the absolute min? Well, 
it's just one of those things. It's just e either a, a minimum or a maximum. Uh, when we talk about absolute, we're talking about over the whole functions domain. When we talk about local, we're just talking about values that are near that particular value. Yes? What is the variable A? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, when X is near A, so it should be near C, actually. Thank you. I'll correct that in, the, um, in what I post. Okay, so it's just the values that are close to the, um, to the x, va x axis value. So um, sorry for that mistake there. Okay, so here's the extreme value theorem. Now, the extreme value theorem, uh, here is one of the criteria that we're talking about a continuous function over a closed interval. That means that A and B, the bounds of this interval, are included in the domain of this function. Then we're going to say that, that this function attains its absolute maximum um, value and absolute minimum value at some numbers um, C and D on A and B. So what that means is that when we have a function that's continuous in a closed interval, that there is a minimum and maximum value. Okay, unlike that example that I had earlier where I said, you know, a line over all real numbers has no absolute minimum and maximums, if we confine that to a certain line segment, then of course there's a minimum and a maximum value. <coughs> so if there's, if it's continuous in a closed interval, there is a minimum and maximum? There is a minimum and maximum. So here's three examples. Here's, here's one where I just have some random function with, with two endpoints. There has to be a minimum and maximum, and in this case, they occur somewhere within the interval. On this one, you can see that the absolute minimum occurs at the endpoint, and that the absolute maximum occurs someplace in the middle up here. Now, here's an example of a function that is not continuous and doesn't have a closed interval. Okay, so there is no local or absolute minimums or maximums on this particular function because there's no single value here that represents its minimum. Now, there's uh, this circle implies that we can get as close as we want to that thing without actually getting there, so there's no single number. So there's no way that I can construct an interval over this discontinuity that will have a local minimum and maximum. I mean, perhaps a local maximum but, or an absolute maximum, but certainly not um, uh, a, an absolute minimum. So the continuity condition in this thing is, is crucially important, as it is with, with many other um, theorems that we'll talk about. Okay, so I think I showed... No absolute minimums or maxes. Okay, so now Fermat's theorem. You can call him Fermat if you like. Enough people do. Um, it's French, so those of you that speak French, what is it? The word careful is C, R, F, and L are the only consonants at the end of a French word that you pronounce. So you don't pronounce the T, I guess, is the rule. I don't speak French. so. Um, but anyway, Guy's an important um, uh, mathematician. Uh, and he um, came up with this thing that if F has a local minimum or, or uh, a maximum or minimum at C, and if the derivative at C exists, then the derivative at that value C is zero. Now that probably sounds backwards to you, that we, nor that we had thought of, um, well, let's find the zeros where, where the derivative is zero, and that should either be a local minimum or maximum. That's actually not entirely true. There's exceptions to that. But this particular theorem says that if the derivative exists and if there is a local minimum or maximum, that the derivative must be equal to zero. So let me draw a couple diagrams here to show you the, uh, that that's the case. So the one on the left, we have a, a function, and it's continuous, and it's differentiable. So at those two points, C1, C2, we have a local maximum, local minimum, and since it is differentiable, the derivatives at those points equal zero. 
Now, here's um, something that is reminiscent of the absolute value function, you know, where we have that sharp point. Remember, we um, showed that the derivative doesn't exist at that, at that sharp point. But here, of course, is a continuous function. There is a local minimum, but it's not differentiable at that point. So this is the case where you would think that Fermat's theorem should be the other way around, but it's not. It's the case where if, you're, if you have a local minimum and maximum, and if the derivative exists, and in this case the derivative doesn't exist, so the derivative doesn't equal zero. So we don't proclaim the derivative to be arbitrarily zero just because it's a local min. It just simply doesn't exist. Now, I think I mentioned critical numbers before, um, more or less in passing, but I want to define them right now. The, um, the critical number of a function is a number c in the domain of f, either that the derivative at that value c is 0, or the derivative doesn't exist. Okay, so in all the cases where you think derivatives don't exist, discontinuities, sharp points, where it goes off to infinity or something of that sort with an asymptote, a vertical asymptote, all of those things define, uh, all those values collectively are called critical points. So if we reword uh, Fermat's theorem, we have, um, if f has a local minimum or maximum at c, then c is a critical number. Okay, so this combines the notion that <coughs> if we have a derivative that doesn't exist at that point, that, that we'll call that a critical number as well. And so we're going to say that the only two cases, um, if we have a local minimum or a local maximum, that um, then C is a critical number. So now this should work a little bit more consistently with what we, um, what we expect when we're, when we're inspecting um, uh, derivatives and, and what value it takes at certain certain places. Okay, so here's an exercise. We're going to find the absolute minimum or maximum on a closed interval A to B. Okay, and so we're going to use um, this principle that we're going to Find where the values of um, f, um, we're going to find the values of f at the critical numbers within that interval, the closed interval, or the open interval, and then we're going to evaluate that function at the endpoints, see if they exist, and then we're just going to choose which ones are the largest or the smallest. Okay, so this combines that earlier. Um, uh, uh, statement about when you have a closed interval that the um, uh, minimums or maximums exist and they either exist somewhere in the intervals or at the endpoints and here we'll just calculate the endpoints and calculate where um, uh, where the critical numbers are so there's an implied step here that we're going to find the critical numbers So let's look at a couple examples here. So I want to find the absolute minimums and maximums at, um, at this function, x squared minus x, on the interval negative 1 to 3. Okay, so uh, it's a continuous function, so we don't have to worry about having any points of discontinuity or anything like that in there. We're going to um, evaluate it. Um, first, we're going to calculate the derivative and then set it to zero when we find that the derivative equals zero when x equals one-half. That's the only place in between negative one and three that it's going to be zero. And so if we evaluate f at one-half and f at the, at the endpoints, so we have f at one-half equals negative one-fourth, f at negative one equals two, and f at three <coughs> equals six, then we just inspect and we say, ah, 6 is the biggest number, so that's the absolute maximum. Negative 1 fourth is the smallest number, so that's the absolute minimum. So it's a fairly straightforward procedure. The tricky part of it is that you just can't be faked out by the function, and 
what um, the definition of critical, um, critical numbers are. In this case, since we have a nice polynomial, there's, there's no doubt about it. It's differentiable everywhere. And so we have essentially, um, in this case, three points to evaluate. If we have more places where um, the derivative is zero, then if those are within the interval, then we evaluate those as well. Okay, so let's um, do a few. I'd like you to do a few, actually. So let's say we have this function, this polynomial, and then we have this other um, rational function, and I want you to find just the critical values. Don't find the minimums or maximums, just as an exercise of finding the critical values. So the critical values, to remind you, that's where the derivative of the function equals zero or where the derivative doesn't exist. Anybody do well on the first one? Okay, so what's the procedure? You take the derivative of this, and then you solve for where it equals zero, right? So where, where are those points? Well, if I take the derivative, So it's negative 1 is the critical point. Okay, how about the second one? Anybody do that? That's all you have? Well, I'm just asking you for the critical point. Okay? Where, why 0? Why is 0 a critical point? Oh, you're, you're talking about the second example. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. All right. I, I was talking about, I was thinking you were answering the first example, but yeah. Okay, so you got zero plus or minus, plus or minus one. Okay, explain your reasoning there. Great, okay. So you included everything. So you took the derivative, found that... Um, when you simplified it, you get something like this. Okay, so then the points that that um, equals zero is when x equals zero and when x equals plus or minus one. So recall back when we were talking with the um, uh, when we were talking about where asymptotes occur, if we just look at the function, you know, we have that x squared minus 1 in the denominator that factors to uh, x plus 1 times x minus 1, so where the denominator equals 0 is division by 0, so the function doesn't work there, so we have a vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote, the x value of the vertical asymptote is a critical number, and so our critical numbers are 0, negative 1, and 1. Okay, let's find now the absolute maxes and mins for these functions on this interval. Now that first one is a polynomial, so we're not guaranteed that we have an absolute minimum or maximum on that over its whole domain, right? Uh, because it could go off to infinity or negative infinity. But since we define an interval 0 to 4, we, we do have an absolute minimum or maximum. And then we have um, uh, the second one, which is that uh, x squared minus 1 cubed um, over another interval. So go ahead and, and, um, and figure those. This time I would like you to find the absolute minimums and maximums. Okay, so let me go through this, this first one, and then I'll give you a little bit more time on the second one uh, so you can complete that. So the first thing that we want to do here is take the derivative of this, 
and then fully factor it so we can see that our critical values are going to be 3 and negative 3. Okay, so now there's four points that we need to test to see which is the minimum and which one is the maximum. So we'll um, uh, evaluate both endpoints. And so f at 0 is 5. f at um, uh, 4 is going to be 93. And then I look at f at 3, which is going to be 113. And f at negative 3 is negative 103. And so those are the minimum and maximum <coughs> values. So here's an example of a function that on this interval, the minimums and the maximums occur somewhere within the interval, not at the endpoints. Okay, so continue working the second one. Um, see if you can get that. Yeah, the absolute minimum, absolute maximum, the biggest and smallest numbers. Yeah. Yes, because it can only the the absolute minimums and maximums can only occur in this case at four points where the derivative equals zero, or the endpoints. Okay. Um, it's multiplied. Oh, okay. That doesn't match, right? Uh, well, yeah, it's a big wrong, but that's, that's what would make it right. Do we have three points? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so let me go over this. So we take the derivative, and so it's the chain rule. And so when we uh, take the chain rule, of course, you take the derivative of that cube to get 3 times the inner function squared times the derivative of that inner function. And so you get a 6x uh, times um, x minus or x squared minus 1 squared. And so the roots of that thing are going to be 0, 1, and negative 1. That's where, where the zeros happen. So then we have five points to evaluate then. Well, actually four points because one of the um, derivatives of zero occur at negative one. So we're going to evaluate it at negative one, that um, uh, the function equals zero there. Uh, f at zero is going to be negative one. And f at two is 27. So we know the maximum, the absolute max then occurs at um, at one endpoint, that 27. The other one occurs at zero as negative one. Yes, Marl. Where did the two come from? The two is the endpoint. Okay, so you look at the endpoints of your intervals, and you have to do the endpoints as well. Okay, that's the case. I'll just draw real rough on the board. If you have a, an interval that looks like this, it's going to be either where you have a zero, um, derivative or an endpoint. Okay, so what's all this stuff good for? This is um, this stuff is used for optimization um, problems. It's um, uh, and I'm sure you've you've done some of these in algebra where they've told you things like um, you know if you're going to throw a rock up in the air, how high does it get? Well, it gets. Uh, you look for the vertex of the parabola, and that's the highest point. Well, this is a general tool now where we can find um, these minimums and maximums by, um, uh, by using this technique. Now, the, 
the, the fact that we have an interval here is, is actually a pretty realistic real world situation because when you're looking for dimensions of something, like if you're going to make something, um, there's usually a practical minimum and maximum that you have. Like, for, for example, if it's a measurement, you don't go below zero. Or if you are limited in a quantity of something, you don't go over that quantity. So in, in kind of that spirit, what I'd like to do is have you work on this problem. And it's a little bit longer than the typical problem that we do in class um, here. But I'd like you to um, find the dimensions of a box. And this box has a square bottom, no lid, so the, the bottom is square, so those two sides are equal. We have a certain height, we have no lid on this thing. What's the biggest box you can make with 27, um, ooh, that should be square feet, not cubic feet, square feet of, um, of cardboard. Let me um, make that change here. Okay, so you have 27 square feet of cardboard. Now, of course, I'm not allowing for any overlap for glue and that kind of stuff. I just want to know what, um, what's the dimensions of this box that will be the, be the largest volume that you can put in there. So you have to think about how you're going to do this, all right? You have a square bottom. The, the, the height of it isn't necessarily the same height as the square. And we don't have a lid. Okay, so there's kind of a rule of thumb that if you do have a lid, if you have a six-sided figure, that your maximum volume is going to be a perfect cube. But without that, it, it's not necessarily a cube. So, um, so I'll give you a couple minutes, and then um, we'll, we'll talk about the approach, and then I'll let you finish off the, the problem. And so let's... Um, define some variables. I'm going to have B as the size of the bottom and H as the side, size of the um, side. And so now I'm going to write out my formulas, the things that I know. I know that my area is 27 square feet of cardboard. So what's the area of cardboard that I have? I have the bottom, which is the bottom squared. I guess I use B instead of S here. The bottom squared plus B times H four times. Okay, so there's the, um, there's the area. Now I, I want to make an expression for the volume, because that's the thing that I want to find out is how big of a volume can I make. And so I write the formula for my volume, and the volume is simply the length times width times height, right? Now, what could you possibly do with this? You have to maximize V, and you want to find B and H. Okay, so you have two equations two unknowns, but you want to maximize, actually three unknowns, you want to maximize one of the unknowns and determine what the other two are. Anybody have any ideas at this point? Okay. Has it differentiate? Um, you have to differentiate, but it's going to be explicit. Okay. So, but what, there's one step that you have to do before you can differentiate. The problem is you have two variables, that B and that H. But if you look at the very first... Um, if you look at the first um, equation, we have b squared plus 4bh equals 27. So it's possible to solve for h. In other words, have an expression for h that, uh, that is in b and 27. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to calculate that h is going to be 27 minus b squared over 4b. I, I brought the b squared over to the side with 27 and then divided by both sides by 4b. And so here's my expression in H. And now I'm going to make that substitution in, in V. Okay, and there's my expression. Okay, so now I have volume as a function of just the, um, the base dimension. So now what do we do? Okay, you were right before. Not implicit differentiation, though. This is going to be... You need to take the derivative of V with respect to B, right? Because at some point, if, if B was zero, right, we would have zero volume. That makes sense. If we didn't have a bottom, if this thing was a point, and we just had a big column of um, cardboard, 
be zero volume. But if we made B very, very large, we would end up with zero volume as well because we would have no height. Okay, so we know what the endpoints could be. The, the endpoints are, are the, the base could be the square root of 27 or it could be zero. So we have our, our problem where we want to find the maximum value of this function limited by zero to the square root of 27. So we'll take the derivative with respect to b. So that turns out to be a fairly, um, fairly straightforward thing. It's just a polynomial. And then we find that by solving for it, we get b equals 3. So we want a 3-foot base here. And now what we need to do is figure out what's the height. Now we have up here this formula for the height um, if we just plug in b. So if I do that, I get... 27 minus 9 over 4 times 3, I get 3 halves. So this thing needs to be a foot and a half tall and 3 feet wide. So my ultimate dimensions then would be a 3 foot by 3 foot by 1 and a half foot box, where that's my length, width, and height. Okay, now notice I didn't actually calculate the volume, right? My criteria was I want the maximum volume. I want the dimensions of the box with the maximum volume. Now, it's easy to calculate the volume. It's 3 times 3 times 1 and a half, which is going to be 13 and a half cubic feet. But, um, you know, that wasn't the question. The question is, what's the dimensions of the box? And so we find that by um, taking the derivative of the volume with respect to one of the dimensions. Now, this is, this is probably one of the most common kinds of, of um, uh, minimization or maximization kinds of problems that you have, optimization problems that you have. Very common in, in an engineering type of calculation. Um, it, it's used, um, uh, I think, by every branch of engineering I can think of. Okay? All right, so um, look for some homework.